today we are going to talk about Shiny. And this is called uh, Shiny Part 1 and 2 because it used to be two lectures and now it's one. Uh, so basically, we're going to talk about the very basics of Shiny and then we'll talk about Shiny dashboards a bit after that. Okay. Um, I uh, don't have a real good feel for how long this is going to last, which is a common problem for me. So um, we may not get through it all. We may get through it all easily, um, but uh, we'll see. Um, the other note I had for you to start is uh, my wife is actually out. So um, I have my girls watching a TV show um, and I think they'll be fine for most of this, uh, but I may need to step out here and there to check on them. So I apologize if, in advance if that is the case. Um, and uh, the way that this lecture is going to work is it's going to be um, a lot of live coding and a lot of challenges. OK, so uh, you should go ahead and get our studio launched now. And you don't have to worry about getting a script going or anything. We're actually going to start a new project once we get into it. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So before we really jump into Shiny, though, I do want to review Lab 3. That is due today. Um, so hopefully you all got that in. And then uh, I don't have this on my notes, but I also wanted to mention that um, you know your draft data script is due today as well. I uh, found out, it, I was alerted to the fact that I had the due date set at different places at different places. So it was today for everywhere, but on uh, some places I said, by the time class starts, and other places I said by midnight. So we'll just say, if you don't have it done now, you can have it until midnight, that's fine. Um, if you want to work on it a little bit more tonight or whatever, uh, you should all though have your peer review assignments now. And um, the links to all the repos are in that CSV that I posted on Canvas. Okay, so um, let me know if you have any questions, but the process is just like it is in previous courses. I'm expecting you to fork their repo, uh, then clone your fork, make changes, add embed comments, all of that sort of stuff, push your changes to your fork, then submit a pull request to their repo, summarize your, your review in the pull request text, and then they'll have the actual code edits that they can look through as well, okay? Any questions with any of that? So peer review is due one week from today, I believe, um, so that uh, then you have one more, I guess you'd have two more weeks. Is it due in one week or two weeks? I can't remember. Um, one week, okay, that's what I thought. So uh, do spend a decent amount of time on these to make sure that you're really giving as much feedback as you can and that you're really trying to learn about their project, but don't spend forever, right? So I would say target somewhere around like 45 minutes per review, so an hour and a half total to conduct all of your peer review. Um, you shouldn't be su spending significantly less time than that, but you shouldn't be su spending significantly more time than that either. So if you find yourself at like an hour and a half and you're still on your first review, then just cut, cut it short and say, you know, I've done um, what I can in the time that I've, I've had or whatever, okay? All right, okay. The learning objectives for today, um, we are going to create a bunch of different apps. They're all going to be pretty minor, pretty small. Um, but also, uh, you have now, because I sent out the link to a repo that has all of the examples that we're going to be going through. OK? And, and then there's a few added complications to those as well. So you should have plenty of examples that you can look at. And of course, as you start to build up more more and more complicated apps, you'll want to go a lot further than what we're going into today, but this should get you started, okay? And that's really the purpose of today is to get you started with Shiny. Like, you're not going to leave this class being an expert in Shiny, um, but you can at least get started, okay? So understand basic layouts and be able to create basic Shiny dashboards as well as basic Shiny apps. So there's Shiny and then there's Shiny dashboard. They're very, very similar, but there's small differences. We're going to go through both of them. Okay, 
let's oops, I will switch my share now and let's go to oh shoot, there it is lab three okay so this is the lab that is due today and uh it had two different parts right so we start out with foundations briefly name and describe the three fundamental components of a function so this is the formals the body and the environment so the formals are the arg arguments that are supplied to a function the body is like the inside of the function what all the operations that are actually happening inside of the function and then then the environment is where the function lives so this has to do with scoping that we talked about um where you know if you have a function that's inside a package then it lives inside of that namespace okay if you have a function that you wrote just in your uh global work environment then it will live in your global environment okay all right three different ways functions can be stored slash applied and examples of when you might want to use each so we have anonymous functions which we've actually been using all term long and those are usually used for functionals like per map or l apply right so you say like l apply um and then you have like l some list you want to iterate over and then you'd say function x and then x becomes a placeholder for each element of the list l right when you're writing function x and then putting what you want it to do that's an anonymous function okay normally i'd say the most common case is when functions are bound to a name um like we typically see with like lm so anytime you're naming a function and then you have the parentheses that means that the function is bound to a name so the lm function for example is bound to lm the mean function is bound to the name mean okay etc okay and then the last functions can also be stored within lists so you can have a list of functions which is a sort of irregular irregular use case but it is a thing and uh it can be nice because sometimes you want to loop through a set of functions to apply to a single vector rather than looping through a vector to apply a single function okay so um that's the three any questions on any of part a okay i am going to let the wait time be a little longer on zoom because you have to unmute to ask your questions and etc so if it feels uncomfortable, it's just because I'm trying to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Also, if it looks like I keep looking over here, it's because that's where you all are on my screen. So I apologize for that. Okay, part B, applied practice. So the mean is defined like this, right? So we're basically going to sum all the things, and then we're going to divide by the number of things. So I asked you to write a function for computing the mean without actually using the mean function, right? Um, and the one thing that was supposed to be different about this is that it was supposed to remove missing data during the calculation, okay? So this, the way I wrote it, it does not even have an option for you not to remove missing data. It just always does, okay? So here's how I did it. I called it my mean, and it's a function that takes one formal argument X, okay? Then once we get into the function, the first thing we're doing is actually a check. So we're not actually doing anything initially. We're just doing a check. What is this check doing? What does that, what's that saying? Any is dot n a x. What do you think that means? What's that checking for? If any of the element is n a. Correct. If any of the elements in X are NA. So is.na is going to give you a logical vector back that's going to be, you know, false, 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 true, false, false, true, false, false, whatever. And it will be true where there are missing data and there it will be false otherwise, right? Any is checking a logical vector like that and seeing if there are any that are true, okay? So when you wrap any in is.na, it's going to say, is there one or more trues within this vector? And that is.na is looking for missing. So it's saying, are there one or more 
missing elements in X, okay? If that is true, then this part is evaluated. And if that is not true, then that is just skipped, okay? So assuming this is true, there are some missing data, then I first computed how many missing data there were. So I said, I computed an object called tote na, where I'm summing is dot na x, okay? So again, this is gonna be a logical vector. When we sum that, the trues become ones, the falses become zeros. So sum is dot na x is just gonna be the, a count of the missing data, okay? Then I throw a warning message where I say tote na observations removed due to missingness. Okay, and then I redefine X. So X is now na.omit X. Okay, so I'm I'm just removing X. The other way I could do this is I could do um, X uh, not is dot na X, right? That would also be a good method. And then after I've dealt with the missing data, then I'm just going to sum X and divide by the length of x. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. The next part was to test your function to make sure it A, provides the expected result, and B, gives identical output to base mean when na.rm equals true. Okay? So we'll look at my mean. Well, I got to define it first. We'll look at my mean for empty cars MPG, I get 20.09. Look at that for mean, base mean, I get 20.09. So that's great, they're the same. Now we do it for ozone and we get this warning message in my mean, 37 observations removed due to missingness. I can call base mean and I get NA, and then I can call mean with NA.RM equals true and I get 42.12931. So those are identical as well, okay? So this is informal testing. I haven't gone super far with it and I haven't built in like automated checks to make sure that this is always going to work. But this is good informal testing to tell me that I've written, I've probably written my function correctly. It's pro providing the results I would expect. And so I'm happy with it to move on. Okay, questions on that? Yeah, how will you do formal testing on this? Yeah, so, um, there are uh, things called unit tests that you can write um, where uh, if it almost always only happens. So there's two different types of unit tests. There's unit tests on functions, which is what I was referencing. And then there's unit tests on data. So for functions, they pretty much exclusively live in R packages. So if you write an R package and you have a function in your R package, which is required, to have, you have to have at least one function to have a package, right? Um, then you write tests that are similar to this, but you write them in a way where you say, uh, expect that the this mean is equal to this mean, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's going to run that, it's going to check if this mean is equal to that mean. If it is, then it's true and it, your test will pass. If it's not, then it's false and your test will fail. And so it's it's a way to make sure that your function is continuing to work over time. So every time your package is built, it will run those sets of checks so that then, you know, your it works today and that's great. But five years from now, uh, you know, things might have changed in our world and maybe it doesn't work now. And so having those checks is sort of formalizing this sort of thing. So you essentially just have a different script that you can run to do all of the checks for you automatically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I asked you to turn these lines into three different functions. And I asked you to give them meaningful names. This, this section is mostly um, was mostly to try to get you to think about naming functions because it's harder than you might think, right? So I pretty much told you what they were doing. This first one is counting the number of missing elements in a vector. The second is giving you the proportional representation of each level in a vector, okay? So unique elements. And then this last one is normalizing or z-scoring a vector. So the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one, okay? So this is how I did it and you could do it differently for sure. 
Um, oh, I also asked you to test the functions to make sure they provide the expected output. So for the first one, I called it count missing, and it's just function x sum is dot na x. And then we can test this out by just doing something really easy. Repeat na 25 times, and then give me 75 non-missing elements, and I get 25. This time I'm saying, give me 42 missing and 58 elements that are non-missing, and I get 42. So basically, whatever this na is here, that's what I'm expecting it to echo back, and it does. So we're good there. Okay, the second one probably could have come up with a better name. Um, maybe change this to categories, prop categories, right? And uh, so this is a function where I'm giving it one argument. I'm calling it cat v, categorical vector. Okay. And so it's going to basically split that categorical vector by the unique elements of the categorical vector. And then um, we're going to map double on that to compute the length of each of those. Okay. And then we're going to divide by the total length of the thing. So when I do that, let me fix these now. I updated it. I just do rep letters one through four each 25 times. I get A, B, C, and D. They're all represent 25% of the time, right? Their proportion is 0.25. If in this case, I'm doing rep letters one 50 times and then letters four through five each 25 times. So I get A is 50% is and D and E are each 25%. Okay, so again, I made these proportions purposefully very easy so that I could see if my computations were coming out as I would expect them to, and they did. Okay, and then this last one, I actually broke it up into two functions. Okay, so this is the function I gave you. I would not expect you to do this, but I'm just showing you because I think it's um, nice. Basically, I created a function called fix missingness. Okay, this fix missingness, if you look back at my my mean thing up here, it's just pulling this part out of it. Okay, so that's nice because now I'm finding two places where I'm using that function. And rather than just copying and pasting that in each function, I can just create a new function, which I'm calling fix missingness, which just includes that. And then it's going to return X. Notice it still has that condition in there because it's saying if any are there, then it's going to go through this and it's going to throw a warning. But if that's not the case, then it'll just return X. So if there's no missing data, essentially nothing will happen. It'll go into the function. It'll immediately output the same thing. Okay, so then for my standardize, I have it looking like this x, I'm going to first fix missingness on x, and then I'm going to say x minus the mean of x divided by the standard deviation of x. So that makes it look a little bit nicer. Okay, then I can test it. So I'm saying standardize air quality ozone, and then scale, which is the base function to do the same thing, air quality ozone, but I have to wrap it in na.omit because my version is already handling that by default, okay? So I do that and it tells me 37 observations were removed. Test standardize is a um, going to be a matrix. So we can kind of scan through this and they sure look similar, but we can do an actual test of that where we call identical on test standardized one and test standardized two, okay? So we're pulling the first and the second columns and checking if they're identical and they are. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, now we get to the little bit harder ones. Um, there are numerous ways to do these, and I chose to do them in a probably more complicated way than is necessary, certainly more complicated than uh, I asked you for, okay? Um, but I think you'll see why as we get through that, okay? So first, write a function that takes the data frame as its input and returns a data frame with only the numeric columns as its output. Um, I'm guessing several of you probably used um, select if is dot numeric on D, right? That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. I wanted to kind of replicate that behavior though with my own function. So the way that I did this is I have my DF and I included an additional 
function as underscore tibble equals true. Okay. If I were to actually write this, I probably wouldn't have this like this. I would probably just return a tibble if they had tidy r installed on their computer and not otherwise. Okay. So um, basically you can check there's functions that you can check if a specific package is installed. And so that's probably how I would do it. I would actually just not have this as an actual argument to the function. And it would just be contingent on whether they had the punk had the package or not. Okay, Tibble. I think I said tidy R. So anyway, to start, I'm going to loop through the columns of the DF of the data frame and just call is.numeric. Okay, so let's um check this out. So like one way to kind of informally build up functions, right? Because this is after the function is already built, but we can also test the functions like this. So I'm creating a thing that it has the same name as the argument, right? So I'll say GSS cat, uh, GSS cat, uh, wait, what was it? GSS cat, uh, oh wait, I think it's, um, maybe I don't have it here. I think it's down here. Four cats, GSS cat, okay. Um, yes, there it is, okay. So I'll call it that, all right? So now DF looks like this. So we have some that are numeric, but actually most of them are not, okay? And so I've called this thing DF, which means now actually I can just run this code right within the function. So map LGL DF is dot numeric. You'll see we get this logical vector in return. So year is numeric. The rest of these are not until we get to TV hours, which is, oh, and age is also, okay? And so then all I have to do basically then is just take the data frame and say, give me all the rows for these columns, okay? These columns being where num is true, and that's what I get, okay? So if it's as tibble, it's gonna return tibble as tibble, df num, otherwise it's just gonna return as that data that frame num okay all right so then we can test this out and we see it works well questions on that okay now this one was actually the one that i made considerably more complicated partly i wanted to show you other additional functions um that you can use okay so uh one of them i'm mentioned i had mentioned just verbally in class before it's called per quietly okay so we have my mean right which has which we did up above and it has this warning in it okay and so we might want to actually use that warning to essentially es extract this to na thing okay so um let me see here Yeah, so uh, basically I'm creating two different functions here. So when I do quiet my mean, um, when I do this, this is creating a new function for me that is a quiet version of my mean. Quiet just does the same thing as per safely, except it will return messages and warnings and everything, okay? Whereas, whereas per safely will only return errors and the result. Okay, per quietly returns everything. Okay, so we have that. Now we're gonna use our extract numeric DF on DF, okay? This is gonna give us our numerics. Okay, so that looks like that. And then we get our means by looping through this column and I'm applying quiet my mean instead of my mean, okay? And that gives us this big long list. Okay, because for each of these, for each column that I went through, year, age, and TV hours, it's returning the result, the output, the warnings, and the messages. Okay, so notice for age, we get this warning 76 ob observations removed due to missing this. Okay, so I want to go through here and I want to grab a few things. So I'm going to first loop through means and grab the warnings. And notice I'm putting dot default as in a character. Okay. If I don't do that, then it's going to return nothing. So I have to have a default. So I do that. And warns now looks like this. So we get NA 
and then our two um, warnings. Okay. And then I'm going to sub out some things. So let me see what this looks like just to make sure. Um, oh, yeah. So this is just subbing out this first part, it's just actually removing this part. Okay. So it, it's saying it starts with a digit and then it goes on to um, have a space. That's what this means a space and then an O. Okay. And then we're going to replace that with a capital O and then the rest of the stuff. Okay. So basically I'm peeling off the numbers there and then I'm saying, okay, what's the unique ones there? There's only one unique um, missing this or one un unique warning there, but uh, many of the warnings had different observations. Okay. So that's the warnings that we have. And then we can go through means and pull that out and we get our different means. We can loop through again and get our standard deviations. Okay. And then um, I need to know if columns were not included in the summary. Okay. So I have names of DF, right? That's all of them. Is that going to be equal to the length of the names of DF num, right? And so uh, DF num is going to look like that. So basically, I'm checking the length of this and seeing if it equals the length of this. Okay. In this case, it does not. So we get this message the following columns were not included in the summary. And then I use this set diff. Okay. Set diff is like a Boolean operator. So it's going to look between these two and it's going to basically remove year because it's in common for both of them, remove age because it's in common for both of them and remove TV hours. All the rest of them should be there, okay? So uh, <clears throat> it ends up looking like this. Marital, race, R income, party ID, village, and denom, okay? Then if the length of warrants is greater than zero, then we throw this warning, okay? And I just basically removed those numbers because they repeat across columns. So we could go further on this and have something that prints out like a column and then the N and then a column and then the N like vertically, right? But I just made it easier this time. And then at the end, we just wrap it all up. So assuming it's a tibble, we're gonna say the variable is equal to the names of dfnum and then the means is equal to the means, blah, blah, blah. So then our table looks like this, okay? And that's it. And so then we can run that whole thing and we get this for Palmer penguins and this for GSS cat. Okay, again, that was, I'm expecting more complicated than the way that you did it. And that's totally fine. Um, mostly I wanted to illustrate why and how you might use per quietly. And so that's why I did that there. Okay, any questions on anything with the lab ready to continue on with shiny okay here we go shiny um so if you haven't seen moana this is tamatua um it's required in my mind to make this joke about shiny if you're talking about shiny if you have kids um this is a very good song and he's very good the basics okay i asked you to get our studio up and going before hopefully you've done that what i'd like you to do now is to go ahead and create a new r project and then we're going to select shiny web application and then we're going to select the directory and then just do create project okay so let's go ahead and do that now I will come back over here. So basically I'm gonna come here to create a new package. Um, sure, I'll save it, why not? It's gonna say new project. So we're gonna take a second for me because I have a, this is a big project. But it doesn't seem like it should take this long. There we go, all right. Um, 
new directory. Can you see that? Hang on. Yes, you can see that, right? Okay. So new directory, and then we're going to say shiny application. Okay. Actually, I guess it, they've changed the name of it. It is just shiny application, not shiny web application. Okay. And then we can say browse. I'll put mine on my desktop. You can put yours wherever you want. And I'll call mine class example. You can call yours whatever you want. Okay. Then we'll say create project. All right. And this is what it looks like. It should still take it. It's just my computer's being slow. I don't know why it's being slow. There we go. Okay. So it's actually starting now. This is new. It's starting with a REN lock file. Um, there's probably ways you can get rid of that if you want to. REN is, I've mentioned it before. Um, is it, are other people seeing REN also? Can you give me a thumbs up or emoji or no? Okay. All right. Some it looks like some people are and some people are not. Um, so if it's not, don't worry about it. If it is, um, you can continue to use it if you want, or you can use REN uh, deactivate, I think. Um, and I'll do that actually because. Um, and then you can probably just trash these because it's going to make it more complicated. Um, but the purpose of using Renv is Renv is like a, it creates a lock file, which we just had there, that has all the packages that you use in your Shiny application, as well as all the dependencies for those packages for the specific versions that you're using. Okay. And so most of the time it works great. It works really well. It goes and actually downloads the specific versions of those packages when you're using this and it works in this sort of like isolated environment. So if, for example, you're using ggplot in, in this uh, REN, you might have to actually install ggplot even though you have it installed elsewhere because you, you're working in this little snapshot that's like separate from your normal R session. And then it'll install it and all its dependencies and it'll figure out what version you're using, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, then theoretically, if I did this all in Rend, I should be able to push it onto GitHub. Somebody else could pull it down and then they would just say Rend restore. And then it, it would go and get all the same package versions that I have. Okay, the reason it ends up being uh, overly challenging at times is because occasionally those old packages end up having like installation issues and then everything just kind of breaks it's not super common but i have had that happen before so um and it yeah tends to happen more on windows i think than mac at least in my experience but uh that could just be the packages i'm working with i don't know um but so this is what you should see okay so first thing that you should do is just go ahead and run the app. So I'm gonna give you two minutes. Um, what I'd like you to do is just click this button here, run app, okay? It's gonna give you a pop-up window here, and then you can click open in browser, and then it should be in your browser and you can play with it here, okay? So I'd like you to take two minutes, do that, and then, um, it's hard to do talk with your neighbor on Zoom, um, but just see if you can look at the code and then look at your app and see if you can kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, two minutes, give it a go.
Okay. So, any ideas what's going on here? It's a little bit tricky because this is base R code, right? Um, so let's just look at this part down here to start, okay? First, we have this thing faithful. Faithful is just a data set that is in R. So you can look at it here like this, okay? And you can see it has eruptions and waiting time, okay? And so we're grabbing just the second column of that, okay? And then we're doing this calculation to compute the number of bins. Um, wait a minute. Uh, why is bins not found? Oh yeah, because I have input bins. <laughs> so this is what makes Shiny actually work. Um, so we have this, we're, right now we are in the server, okay? And up here, we have the UI, okay? The UI has these things that you're creating, in this case, bins, okay? So anything that you name up here becomes an element of the input list. So you have in the server, this thing called input, right? And it acts functionally just like a list of all of the things that are coming from the, the UI, okay? So bins is what is coming here. So you can see how it's very reminiscent of functions. I could call this bin width, um, the D bins, bin width the D bins, okay? And then I could, I would change this down here to bin width the D bins. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what you call it up here, but it is the same thing down here. Okay, that defines the bins, and then we're calling a histogram on X, which is the second column, where the breaks are equal to the bins. Okay, so those bins, um, which were calculated here, and again, you know, I could call this like N bins and N bins. Okay, and then we're defining a color and a border. Fine. But this is defined by the input, okay? So this bin with the bins thing that I did up here, this is from my UI, which stands for user interface, right? And this is gonna be the title of this thing. And then it's going to take the values from a minimum of one to a maximum of 50, and it's going to start at 30, okay? And this is going to be through a slider. So when we run this again, I'll save it. We can see that this is our slider input, right? As I change this, our histogram changes because those bins change, okay? This will become more clear as we continue to go on, okay? So starting with the UI, the UI stands for the user interface again. So you can think of this, if, if you're familiar with web development stuff at all, the UI is basically the front end and the server is basically the back end. Okay, so the server is sort of doing all the computations and then the UI is showing them. That's how you, this, the UI is what the person seeing the app actually sees and what they're interacting with, okay? So you use the UI to define where the output lives. Okay, so you create a plot, you decide where that's going to be. Is it going to be the first thing they see? Is it going to come after a table? Is it going to be wherever, right? Um, it also defines those inputs for the server. And those inputs are those things that you want to change. Okay, so if you're wanting somebody to interact with things and you want to say, have them select variables, then you need to define an input that has the variables that they can select, okay? And then in this case, we have the slider input, which we're calling bins or I just changed to bin with the D bins, right? Um, which takes on values from one to 50 and starts at 30. And then we access specific values through input bins, okay? All right, the server takes input from the UI and puts it in normal R code, okay? So in this case, we're creating one output object called dist plot, but again, we could call that whatever we want. So I am calling it dist plot here, but what if I called it distro 
instead. Okay, then up here, I would just say, okay, main panel plot output. I want to output distro there. Okay, so we have this sidebar layout. We have a side panel which has this slider input. And then in our main panel, we have this plot output, which is where we're saying distro is going to live. Okay, and distro is defined by output dollar sign distro. Okay, so if we say had a table, we would have output dollar sign table, and we would just define additional. So output ends up being just a, another list. Okay, so we have an input list that goes to the server, and then the server does the computations, and then we have an output list that goes back to the UI, and that's where we define where everything lives. Okay, and so you can call these things on the output whatever you want, just make sure that you're storing them in the output list. Okay, and it's technically not a list, but we can think of it as a list. Okay, all right. Um, so we're creating one object, which we're calling this plot or distro or whatever. And the result is then called on the UI on line 30, which I just showed you. So let's try removing lines 39 to 44. So um, 39 to 44. So basically all of this stuff. And then um, we're going to re uh, replace it with input bins, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna just say print input bins, except it wouldn't be bins, it would be bin with the D bins because we, that's what we defined it up here, okay? All right, so given that, and given that distro lives here, what would you expect that this is going to do? Will it just print the bins? Yes, it should just print whatever the slider is at, right? However, when we do that, we get nothing actually. Okay, so that's confusing because it sure seems like that should work, right? But it does not because this is saying plot output. And this is no longer a plot, right? This is just text. So instead we just change plot output to text output. And then when we run it, we get invalid quartz device size, okay? Let me try this again then. Um, maybe we need to take this print off of there. Oh no, I know what it is. I have render plot here. So I don't want render plot, I want render text. Okay, and now I run that and yes, it works now. Okay, not a very, very exciting app, but it does what we wanted it to, right? Okay, so feels like it should work, but it doesn't. The reason why is we need to say render text output and or render text and then text output, okay? So by convention within Shiny, you always have, it's always camel case, rather almost always, I shouldn't say always, there's a few examples where that's not the case, like DT um, is not camel case, but generally almost always, things in Shiny are camel case, okay? And there's always a render function and a output function, okay? And those go in sort of opposite orders. So render plot, plot output. Render text, text output, okay? That's generally how it's, how it's going to be. Okay, so we already tried that and it works. All right, so big challenge, 10 minutes. I would like you to try to reproduce what we did with the first one, where we have that histogram and we're just changing the slider input to make it the bins change. But instead of rendering it with the base histogram function, I want you to render it using ggplot. Okay, does that make sense? So it, it will be the exact same output, except it will look like a ggplot histogram instead of a whatever histogram, base plotting histogram. Okay, any questions? All right.
Give it a go. I'm gonna go check on my girls. I'll be right back. All right. Uh, give me some sort of a reaction with your emojis as to how successful you felt like you were with that. Okay, pretty good. I'm feel, feeling good about that. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch to ggplot, or to ggplot, to R now, and I will show you uh, how I would do this. Okay, so the first thing that I would do, get rid of this stuff. You always have to have shiny, but you also now need ggplot, ggplot two. Okay, so that's the first thing. I would recommend strongly that you include ggplot2 up there and not tidyverse, okay? Because if you do tidyverse, it's gonna load a whole bunch of other stuff and it's gonna make your, your app much bigger and bulkier than it needs to be. So only load the packages that you absolutely need at the top there, okay? Um, because when you launch your app, it's gonna have to install those packages, okay? So then we have our bin width down here and then in, this part we're going to do our distributions okay so we're going to we're going to create a distribution for um uh what was it called faithful faithful um for the second column which was waiting okay so the way i would do this is to first do this outside of the shiny app and then we'll work with it inside the shiny app. So this is very much like building a function. Okay, so I'll go ggplot faithful. Um, a yes, I want waiting on the x axis plus geom histogram. And then if I really wanted to make it look like the other one, I could also do, um, let's see, it would be color equals white and fill equals we'll do like gray 60. okay and then i'll go plus theme minimal okay so that's that and then to control the bin width right i just say um let's see what what is it i can't remember it's going to be um there's bin width, but bins, that's what I thought it was. So we're gonna go bins equals, let's go 20, right? And we get that, or we could do 200 and we get something that doesn't even make sense, all right? Or we could do two and we get that, okay? So that's the one that we need to change. So this is basically it, that's what we want. I'm gonna bring this down here and put it inside my output distro thing. But then all I need to do now is change this bins right there to input dollar sign uh, bin with the bins. Okay. And then because this is getting a little big now, I'll probably do this. All right. Okay. And I think, oh, I still have this as text output. So I got to go plot output. And I gotta change this back to render plot. Okay, feel pretty good about that. Let's try it out. Run the app, and there it is. Sure enough, it works. Okay. Any questions on that? Great. Okay. Changing the input. So let's say instead of a slider, we want five options, five discrete options. One, five, and 20, okay? Oh, one, five, 20, 50, and 100, okay? Instead of having the slider input, we can change it to something else like say radio buttons. Radio buttons are a good choice generally when you have, a, um, when you have discrete choices like that, okay? So, all we have to do in this case is just change slider input to radio buttons 
and then put the appropriate choices in there. You can also add a selected argument, which will be the default. Okay, so you can follow along with this part if you want, or you can just watch me. Um, I tend to pretty much always go radio buttons and then look here. Okay, and up here where I have slider input, I'm going to just change this to radio buttons. Okay, and then um, I tend to like to do things like this. I can label this if I wanted to. Input ID is equal to that. And then the label is equal to that. So this is like the title of it, right? And then instead of min, max, and value arguments, I'm now going to have, um, I'm now going to have choices is equal to C. And then I said, what were my choices? I said 1, 5, 20, 50, or 100. So 1, 5, 20, 50, or 100. Okay. And then um, my selected is going to be 20 or if not 30, 20, okay? That's all I have to do. And then I can rerun the app and we should see, if I refresh this, now we have buttons, okay? There's also, notice how this is stacked vertically. I don't really like the way that looks. Um, inline equals false, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Render the choices inline. Yeah, so let's change this to inline. Inline equals true. And then reload the app. And we come over here and refresh. Now it's like this. Okay, I think that looks better. One is also a terrible number for a histogram. So we probably shouldn't have that, but we do. Any other question or any questions on that part? So you can see how we can start to modify an app, right? We have some sort of output that we want. We start to build that up. And then we have we have some input. We build a UI for it. And then um, we decide whether we want it to be a continuous or discrete, build something for that. And you can just kind of start to modify it. Zach? Just to confirm, when you are um, uh, calling an input, uh, as part of your, your your output, is it just that it takes whatever the form of the data are when you first created like that that list? So because you had those as numeric, they remained numbers, um, or is there any sort of transformation that happens between point A and B? So there is generally not a transformation that happens. However, when you're working with the tidyverse in particular, you're going to want to be careful about that and because of non-standard evaluation. So generally, the way that I would do that is I would actually make them character on the input, and then I would um, transform them into symbols through Arlang in the server. So we'll actually get to examples of that too. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, we already did that, so we'll just continue on. Okay, so more complicated. Let's say we wanted to show the distribution of highway miles per gallon that could be faceted by year, transmission, or class. Okay, so we're looking at the distribution of highway miles per gallon, and then we're going to swap out what variable it's going to be faceted by. Okay. But we want to keep that slider to control the bins, all right? And then we're going to use radial buttons for the variables and that slider input for the bins, OK? So we'll need to create a second entry for our UI. Um, and we're going to use the MPG data set for this, OK? This is pretty challenging, um, but I didn't let you practice on the last one because I messed up. So. Do you want me to set the timer for five minutes here and you can try to do this on your own? Or would you like to me to just demo it? Give me a quick emoji thumbs up for you to try, thumbs down for you not trying. Okay, you try first then. Um, so uh, one more time. Um, because I'm, I need to go back to my other slide to get the, the thing. But you can look on, you should have access to these slides. 
facet by variables, keep the slider input there for the, um, the number of bins, okay? So you'll have to create a second UI, but you shouldn't have to modify anything in your server, okay? All right, five minutes, go ahead and try. All right, hopefully you were able to get most of the way there, if not all the way there. Um, so let's go back over here and we're gonna uh, look at the distribution of, so we got, um, we're gonna go with MPG and we're looking at the distribution of, what were we looking at? MPG. So I'm using the wrong one. MPG data set, no. What? Uh, highway miles per gallon, okay. Um, so HWY is what it's gonna be, I'm pretty sure. Yes, HWY. Um, bin width, all of that is still good, okay. Um, so that's for the distribution, but then we need to, oh, I said you didn't have to modify your server. I was wrong because you have to modify your server for the data set and for the faceting, right? Um, so then facet wrap, and then I'm going to wrap by, um, some input, right? So I'll call it input var. Okay. So I've got input bin with the bins and input var. Okay. Up here, I've got input bin with the bins, but that's radio buttons and that's not actually what I want. Okay. So what I want is slider input. And I just always have to do this because I forget. Oops, that's that part. Okay, so slider input. Uh, that's fine, but then we're going to have the min and max values. Min equals one, max equals 50, and then Instead of selected, we're going to have value equals equals 30. Okay. And then I'm going to get rid of this inline thing. Okay. So that's good. And then um, we're going to have a second input here. Okay. Which is going to be radio buttons. And I'll just go back on this. Okay. So now we're going to have our input ID is going to be var, because that's what I called it below. For my label, I'm only going to say facet by whatever, right? And then the choices are going to be equal to, uh, what did I say over here? Year, trans, and class. So year, trans, trans class. Okay. Um, I think that should be good. Oh, I need a selected on there too. Selected, we'll go with ear. Okay, I think that should work. Let's try it. Open it up and I'm not getting anything. Okay, let me go back here. What is wrong? Um, maybe. Let me just pull this out for a second. I'll come down here and just comment this out. Oops. And then that's wrapped by, let's see here. Yeah, that works. Oh, but I need to do plus. I'm missing a plus. That's all it is. Okay, so because theme minimal was the last thing that was actually being on there. Okay, so now I can get rid of this part. Save and then run my app. Come back over here, refresh, and there we go. So now they're both set to 30. Now that's changing both of them. Click trans, that swaps that. So everything appears to be working. Okay. Questions? All right. Um, it might be frustrating to watch me do this um, fluently when you're struggling. Um, don't worry. I was much, much slower at this when I first started. Um, so if it's not making sense, 
uh, as I'm doing it, don't worry, you will get there. It just takes practice, okay? All right, other little minor changes you can do. You can change the uh, size of the plot and um, sort of the, the whole thing. So if I look here, this is my side panel part right here. So I can make that bigger or smaller, and then I can change my output uh, plot height too. So coming back over here, and on my side panel, I can say width equals, let's see, is it in inches? I uh, I'm not sure what unit it's in. Um, let's see if we can find out real quick. Sidebar, layout. Oh no, I want to say by panel, not layout. Um, width equals four, but what is the unit? Width of the sidebar and main panel by default, the sidebar takes up one third of the two thirds. It doesn't tell us what the units are. So I don't know what they are, um, but we can just mess with that number anyway. Okay, so I've changed it to two. That should make it smaller, I believe. Um, refresh, yes, see how much smaller that is now. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then I can change my plot output height too. So back here, just in your plot output, change the height. And this one, you can see it is in pixels. So plot output height equals 800 pixels, put that in quotes. And then refresh, and refresh, boom, much bigger. These lines or these labels are all tiny though. We should also probably make those bigger too. Right, so I could do that through down here. Space size equals, let's say 25, okay? Reload, refresh, much better, okay? All right, tables. Um, so my recommendation for tables is that you use one of the two following. There are other options, of course. Um, DT is, or G, GT is another one. Um, but uh, yeah, these are my favorite. Reactable is actually my very favorite, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a table for our, our Shiny app now that's going to go below our distribution. And it's gonna show the min or the mean standard deviation, min and max of the corresponding distributions. Okay, so if we look back at this, we wanna be able to show this, show the means, means standard deviation, min and max of highway miles per gallon by whatever it's faceted by, right? 1999 and 2008. So we wanna facet it by year in this case. Okay, so we wanna have those means reported in a table down below here, okay? So we'll need to create a new output object in the server to do that. And then we'll need to tell the UI where it should be rendered, okay? Also with this, we're going to use render reactable or render data table rather than render plot, okay? And we'll do data table output or reactable output in the UI, okay? Um, if you want to use dplyr, as I would, then you're gonna to wanna to use bang bang sim on your input var, okay? Where sim just transforms the character to be a symbol instead of a string, okay? Do you wanna try on your own again, or do you want me to just demo? Thumbs up or thumbs down, please. Thumbs up for you trying. I got one vote for each, okay. More votes for me just demoing. Okay, all right, I will just demo then. So um, here we go. First, I wanna create a table, right? Where I have MPG and I'm going to, so I'm just gonna do it down here, right? I have MPG. And I'm going to, I know I'm going to need dplyr. So I'm going to load that up here. Dplyr. Okay. 
and then I'm going to go MPG um, group by year, we'll say in this case, and then summarize where the mean is equal to mean highway and a dollar m equals true. I don't think there actually are any missing data, but just to be safe. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing, but with standard deviation and then min and then max. So we'll go standard deviation, min, and max. Okay, that gives us what we want for our table. And then we can group by something different. So, uh, there, right? Group by something different. So that's good. And then um, we just want to go to reactable, right? So I'm gonna have to load reactable as well. And then we can try this just like this. And we see our table comes up as we want it to. However, we probably want to actually round these things. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna just uh, set it all equal. And then I can do this fanciness round. Lots more places. Okay, and there we go. Much better. Okay, so there's my table. And now I'm going to come down here and I'm going to create a new output. Okay, so I'll call it, call it output table. Okay, and then because I'm doing reactable, I'm going to say render reactable. Okay, then I put the curly braces and I'm going to put my code in there. Okay, notice I do not need the input bin with the deep bins, but I do need the var that I'm going to select. So I just change this to input var, okay? And that's gonna interactively select it. Up here now in my ma main panel, I have my plot output. I'm just gonna put a comma and then say reactable output. And then I put the name of the thing, which I called it table. And that, that should be it, okay? So I'll save that and let's see if it works. I think it should. Yep, there it is. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back over here. Refresh. And here's our table. Um, that input var doesn't look very friendly, though. Right? Um, and it's actually not working, is it? You know why? Why is this not working? Notice the means and standard deviations are not changing. Any idea why? Let's look back at it. It's down here. This is where our problem is. Any idea what's going on there? We may have to do non-standard evaluation. That's it. So we're going to go bang, bang, sim on the input var. And uh, that should be all we need to do. Come back over here, refresh. And there it is. Now it's perfect. Trans. Pretty nice, right? We have a pretty nice shiny app now that we've developed here in like an hour, I would argue. I mean, the actual content isn't that exciting, but the layout and everything working is pretty neat. Any questions on this? Okay, we're gonna do one more thing before we do our before we take our break, which is we're gonna change the layout. Okay, so instead of having a table below, let's say we wanted it within a tab set. So there's two tabs, one tab for the plot and one tab for the table. Okay, to do this, we modify only our UI, and we're gonna use tab set panel. Okay, um, and this is tab set panel goes within main panel. And then we're gonna put each of our things within tab panel after that. Okay, 
So coming back here, we have up here in our main panel, we'll go tab set panel. Okay. And then we'll have uh, tab panel plot output, comma, tab panel. And then we put our reactable output. Okay, you can see that the number of um, parentheses start to cascade pretty quickly here. Like, they, so your code styling becomes unbelievably important in this um, because otherwise you can very quickly lose track of what is matching up with what. Like, why is this? Uh, that should be there. Yes, everything is put over a little bit differently than it should be. whatever i'm just gonna keep it okay so we'll go run and yeah so i do have something wrong here um so let me let me see here what's going on tab set panel within the main panel then put that on the main panel. that's what i have right tab panel i feel like i've got something messed up with my Parentheses. Hmm. I don't know. It looks okay to me. Um, well, this might be a case where I need to go. Oops, that's not gonna work. I might need to go open up my one that works. <laughs> See what I did differently because uh, okay. main panel, tab set panel. Oh, I have titles for them. I wonder if you have to have titles. Maybe I should have put that in there. Plot. That's it. How annoying is that? Okay, so you have to have titles on them or it won't work. Um, but otherwise, it all is working. Okay. Kind of neat, right? There is also, um, uh, there are also ways to, oh, that's the next thing we're going to talk about, I guess. Okay, so we're gonna continue on with this. There will be more challenges and things. We're gonna switch to shiny dashboards here in just a little bit, which are very similar, um, but just slightly different. Okay, they're only really different in terms of the look and feel of, a, of them once they're done, but in terms of interacting with them, they're very, very similar to just standard shiny. Okay, so we'll take a break. Um, think of questions while you're on your break if you want to and come back and uh, we can chat about whatever you might be confused about. Okay, so we'll see you in five minutes. Okay, onward. So an alternative to the tab sets that we just saw is um, using a nav bar. So you could actually have essentially separate pages for each of these, okay? Um, this is going to be quite a bit more complicated than, um, than the tab sets. And it's probably only really worth it if you're using an, an app that, or if you're creating an app that has is, is probably a fairly large and B has very distinct sections. Okay. And you can have separate pages of your app that each have tab sets in them too. So you could have different sections within this section or whatever. Um, but 
keep in mind, the bigger you build your app, the more complicated it's going to be. And that's one of the things that we'll start to talk about more as we get going is ways to sort of clean up your code and uh, build apps in a way that it's not getting totally out of control with the number of parentheses that you have to manage and things, okay? So the way that we're gonna do this, if you wanna do this, is um, you use navbar page, and then you create a page with tab panel, just like in tab set. But each tab panel has to include everything, okay? So it has to have the sidebar panel, if you have a sidebar panel, the tab set panel, the main panel, et cetera. Okay, so you um, you also have to move your, your title so that it's in the navbar page or it won't work. So that's very similar to the tab, tab sets needing to have titles also, okay? Um, also, if you have multiple pages, you can't share input IDs across them. So if you have an input ID that is uh, doing the same thing, you just basically would call it like, you know, bins one and bins two or whatever you're gonna call them. Okay, um, we will, let's look at one of these, but I'm gonna not uh, try to live code this because it ends up being a lot. Um, so hang on just a second and I will open it. So here it is, right? We have nav bar page, here's our title, highway miles per gallon. And then we have tab panel and the first one is called plot. Okay, then we have our sidebar layout, we have our sidebar panel, this is where we have our slider input and our radio buttons, and then we have our main panel and our plot, plot output, okay? Then we have tab panel again, and then we have um, another title, and then we have sidebar layout, sidebar panel, radio buttons, and then we have reactable output, okay? Notice though in this one, we have, um, we have bins var and var2, okay? So this is what I was referring to before. Then down here below, we have dist plot and dist table. On dist table, I'm using input var2 instead of input var as I am on dist plot, okay? And so when we run all of this, it looks like this. So here's our number of bins, right? And our faceting, which is all good. But up here now we have highway miles per gallon here and we have plot and table. Okay, so with again, within here, you could have all sorts of different stuff, but it gives you like a full page for each of them. Make sense? All right. Probably should have done that before the break. Um, okay, so, so sort of the conclusions for just basic sort of what I would call like vanilla shiny. Um, super customizable, like we're uh, just really introducing you to it today. So again, I mentioned this before, but it, like the point of this lecture and really even the next lecture too is not for you to become an expert in it. It's to introduce you into it and get your get your feet wet sort of, right? Um, there's a book which I linked to in the slides called, um, or in the syllabus called Mastering Shiny. It's a new book, um, it says it's currently under development. I don't think that's true anymore. Um, but it is a new book and it's got a bunch of stuff. Okay. So if you want to, I haven't read most of this book. Um, I have not read most of that book. So, uh, if you wanted to go deeper, that book would be a great resource for you. If you wanna do things like build apps for production where they're actually being used in the production environment and you've got a whole bunch of people using them. So for example, let's say you're running a study and that's, that study has um, 200 participants. In that case, that's small enough that you, and so you wanna maybe use a Shiny app for something that they're interacting with. In that case, it's small enough that you could probably get away with just the standard shiny practices that I'm kind of talking about here. But if instead, let's say you graduate and you go and work for a company and uh, they want to use shiny to show off some of their data to their customers and you've got thousands of users per day, then that's gonna be a totally different thing. And so you're gonna wanna build, um, 
your app very differently. So there's a book called Shiny in Production. I can't remember what it's called. Um, let's see, what's the guy's name? Pinkar is the company he works with. There it is, Colin Fay, that's who it is. Um, engineering production grade shiny apps. So this is a good uh, a good resource for that sort of thing if you get to that point. Um, but this is like several levels beyond where we're at currently, okay? All right. Um, the other thing is, uh, I sort of mentioned this just a second ago, but your apps can get very complicated very quickly. So one of the best ways to do to fix this is to just pull out bits of code and put them in different scripts, and then you can source those scripts, okay? Um, so not everything has to live within the same thing, okay? Um, I think we'll have some examples of that later, although I'm not sure there's any in the apps I sent you. Um, okay, good enough. On to Shiny Dashboard. Unless there's questions, I'll pause for a second. Are there questions before we move on to Shiny Dashboards? Actually, sorry, I've got a cat right behind the computer. Mm -hmm. um, for so the two resources you just mentioned, I flipped through Mastering Shiny. Um, would would the uh, engineering production level? Oh, there he goes again. Um, <laughs> He's really mad about the computer. Um, <laughs> would that also have feedback not on um, huge numbers of users, but instead on kind of negotiating computationally and kind of data moving around heavy apps as well? Uh, likely. I, okay. I haven't read much of that book, but yes, I think that that's going to be um, helpful in that uh there is a problem with shiny apps generally that they have to live they have to have a server so they have to unlike basically everything else that we've done with r it has to have like a live computer that it's interacting with and so when we're building them just locally here it's actually using our computer and that our session that we have going is live and so you can you can't actually do anything else on your r session while it's running um so when you launch a Shiny app and you like publish it on the web, it's the same sort of thing. You generally have to containerize it into this package where R is installed and then it's gonna basically launch R and it's gonna launch that process just the same, but then it's just gonna show the parts that we see while it's interacting with R through the computer that way. So if you have a really big complicated app, it's going to take a long time to install all the packages, to load the data, to move the data around, to do the data transformations, whatever. And it can get to the point where the app is like not even usable, even though theoretically it's, it's a good idea. It's just not helpful anymore because it takes so long to process. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get around that. One of the best things to do is to profile your code. Um, and so I would do that probably before I did anything specifically with Shiny. But for example, and then there's actually another one um, called Shiny Profiler. But very often, you think that your code is slow because it's running into some bottleneck. The problem is, we are very bad at actually guessing where that bottleneck is. So we think it's one place, spend a bunch of time trying to optimize that code, and the bottleneck ends up being way down the line, or it's before that point, or whatever. And so profiling your code can really help you identify those bottlenecks because it'll tell you the time that it's taking for each process as it's going through. And then you can look through and sort of see where it's happening. With Shiny, with Shiny Profiler in particular, it's nice because it will tell you things like when the data are being uh, moved, like when it's reading the data in and when it, it, it's, if it's doing any writing of data, it'll show you how long that's taking. And one of the easiest ways around that is to just use things like the arrow package, where instead of reading in a CSV, you're reading in like a parquet file, which is gonna be much, much faster. And it can also store big amounts of data in very small, small um, size. So just like little tricks like that can help a ton with those sorts of issues, um, which is a little different than having a ton of users, but like there's they're both in the same, 
ballpark. So I would guess that book probably has some resources, but profiling your code is going to be your best friend. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, off we go then. So what I'd like you to do now is um, unlike Shiny, there is no just like a default template that you can get for a Shiny dashboard. So if you are on the slides currently, you can just copy this code. And I would like you to go ahead and do that. Do this in a new script so you're not like wiping out all the, your old stuff, unless you want to, it doesn't matter. You'll have access to all this stuff after. Um, but basically just copy this code. This is gonna be your UI. And then we'll talk through this in a second. And then your server, and this is what that's gonna look like. Okay, so I'll do this to copy that. And then close out of these, create a new one, put that for my UI. Come back to the slides, next slide, copy this, move over here, paste that. And then the last part is Shiny App UI server, okay? So this is a very basic Shiny dashboard instead of um, a Shiny app. So dashboard header, title, basic dashboard. Then we have a dashboard sidebar, which I'm putting nothing in currently. And then we have the dashboard body where we have this fluid row. Just like in flex dashboard, we need to define things either by rows or by columns, okay? And so in this case, I'm choosing rows. And so I'm putting a row that's gonna have two boxes in it, okay? So the boxes is another thing that's very different with flex or with shiny dashboard versus uh, regular shiny, okay? So you define a row, and then you define boxes that things go in. So box, plot output, plot one, okay? Plot one is coming from down here where we're rendering a plot, where I'm getting histogram data and then I'm plotting a histogram, okay? And so we're putting a plot there and then we have a second box, which I'm titling controls and it's gonna include the slider inputs and uh, it's gonna say the number of observations, okay? So when we run this, uh, I gotta save it first. Um, so I'll call it dashboard. Okay, now I get this run app button because now it knows it's a shiny app. I click run and you can see it looks totally different than what we had before, okay? But really it works exactly the same, right? Nothing is really different in terms of the way that it's working. It just has a different layout, essentially, okay? So this is our row that we defined, and then it's got two boxes, this one for the plot output and this one for the controls, okay? So um, you have now with Shiny Dashboard, you have Dashboard Sidebar and you have Dashboard Body, okay? You also have Fluid Row and Box, to arrange things within the main body, okay? The sidebar is, I would argue, one of the defining characteristics of the dashboard. And uh, you can include menu items within that sidebar menu, okay? So for example, we can include a sidebar menu where we're saying that this is the label, histogram, and what does that refer to? What tab name does that refer to? And then you can also add these icons. Um, so if you look at the help documentation for icon, you will see it's just basically font awesome ones, okay? So um, copy this, come back over here. And then uh, let's see, what is that? sidebar menu. And that's gonna be inside the sidebar, inside there, okay? So histogram, tab name histo. I don't think this is referring to anything yet. Um, so let's just run this and see what happens. I feel like we're missing something here, but 
Yeah, okay. So we are missing something for sure, but that's okay. Um, you can see we have now buttons here that are doing nothing because we, we aren't defining them to be anything, okay? But we've put them in the sidebar because we've defined them here. So histogram and bin counts, notice histogram, bin counts. And we have these little icons because we said icon, chart bar, icon, table, okay? So I bet you can guess what the next step is. We're gonna make those buttons do something, okay? So um, once you define menu items, you have to give them a tab name, as we just saw. I did histo and table or whatever. And then in the dashboard body, you create tab items and tab item. Okay, so this is creating tabs just like we did before when we were creating two tabs within a page. But this is just now going to refer to those buttons are going to do the switching instead of the little thing up above. Okay, so um, within dashboard body, uh, dashboard body, um, let's see, do I want fluid row? I'm gonna say yes, I'm not actually sure though. So we'll go tab, uh, panel, what is it? Tab items, tab items, and then I'll call this one histo, okay? And let me pull it down here. Histo, and then I'm gonna put that uh, block box. I probably need a fluid row in there too. Fluid row box. Okay, and then I'll go. Let me let me just look at the help documentation. Oh, whoops. <laughs> tab items here, but then I need tab item. Okay, that should be good. Tab items. Okay, let me look at this real quick. Tab name. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Tab name. So I knew it was the first argument, but I wasn't sure what it was called. And I wanted to actually put it in there. Okay, then I'll go uh, here, comma, tab item, tab name. In this case, we're going to go bins. Okay. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Tab name equals bins. Okay, and then we'll go fluid row again. And then box. And then uh, controls. I'm just going to put this. Um, yes, that's here. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. I'm not feeling super confident about this one, but we'll give it a go. Um, notice I'm checking all of my parentheses. I think that is good. I'm not 100% sure if I need fluid row in each of those. But let's see. Yeah, so there's my histogram and here's my bin counts. So this is really not useful. <laughs> but it does work, right? Um, so I have to click on one of these things to change the histogram over here. But you can see at least that we got what we wanted, which is our buttons take us to two different things and those things loop in different places, right? Questions? Okay. Another thing that is neat is that right in the sidebar, we can actually put our controls. So um, it's a little bit less than ideal, to have, a, a little bit, I'd say a lot of it, um, less than ideal to have the slider separated in this other tab. 
So instead we can put it right in the sidebar. Okay. The other thing that is nice about using that sidebar like that is it can actually control things across multiple tabs too. Okay. So coming back here, I can take my slider input. I'm going to leave this box here. I'm just going to leave it empty. But up here, or I can put it below, I can just put that slider there. Okay. And then when I run this, we can see there's my slider, right? And I still have this thing, which is just an empty box at this point, but this slider could theoretically control things across both of these, okay? So that's super nice too, I think. Okay, I wanna pause for just a second. How are we feeling? Are we feeling like super lost or are you feeling okay? Give me some sort of indication. All right, good. Errol gave me a mountain. I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> okay. So more complicated. We're going to switch data sets. We're going to go to the four cats GSS cat um, one that I saw I used before. Okay. We're going to put plots on one page. We're going to put a box plot with TV hours on the y axis, a count, uh, another plot with counts of x variables, and then another plot with the proportion of x variable. Okay. Um, I'm saying x variable because. I want to be able to select what that variable is, okay? Then we'll have the table on another page and we'll be able to select the variable for the x-axis on the sidebar. So whatever this x variable is, that's gonna be on the sidebar, okay? Um, and then the variable selection should produce table with means by the variable, okay? I would, um, I know this is, hmm, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to try to get started on this one. I'm not expecting that you'll be able to get all the way through, but I'm gonna give you seven minutes, okay? I'm gonna give you seven minutes. I'd like you to get as far as you can with this, okay? Um, again, I know that this is challenging, but uh, if you've been following along, which is, is no problem if you haven't, um, but I would love uh, if you could try to um, get the two pages going. So a button uh, that goes to the two pages and then start to put together the plots on one page or the table on the other. Okay, one or the other, you can choose. If you get all the way through in seven minutes, that's amazing. So good for you, um, but I'm not expecting that. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna set the timer on my phone. I don't have it up there. Okay. Go ahead and go. Okay. Um, hopefully, you got some of the way there. Um, this is a lot, a lot. Like, this is a, this is a pretty sizable app. Um, and so, trying to do it in seven minutes is way too difficult. Um, but hopefully you were able to at least start on it. So what I'm going to do to do this is I'm going to start by just um, loading GSS cat, right? So I'll go for cats, GSS cat, and I'm just redefining it as D just so it's easier for me to work with. So I can look at D here and it looks like this, right? So these are all the different variables. We've got two others here, denom and TV hours, right? And then um, from there, I can I can say, okay, well, I want to have box plots with TV hours on the y axis and uh, counts of x variables and proportions of y x variables. So basically, let's just like try to start this off. So ggplot um, d, as uh, uh, I want TV hours on the y axis, right? And then um, for the x axis, oops. The x-axis, I want whatever. Let's say marital. 
there's plus uh what was i doing just a box plot uh, is that right yeah okay um so so plus geom box plot okay uh so that looks like that okay and then i could of course change this to something else like village okay but importantly this can't be like um this can't be like age right that's not going to work and so i could change this to be a factor and then we would get one for every single age but that's going to be like craziness right so instead i would probably just do something like this where i would say um uh categorical or whatever and then i would say d um i'd probably just do select if d is dot factor okay and then that's going to be uh all of them that are factors and then if i wanted to get just the, the variable names i could just call names categorical and that's how i would get them okay so this is one plot that i'm going to do and it's going to um it's going to need this right the, the names of those categorical variables that's what's going to be changing is um this bar okay all right and then the second one was counts of an x variable all right so um again we can just use those categorical ones if we wanted to so i could say ggplot categorical um although i'd probably do it like this i'd probably go categorical counts um i don't know whatever marital right that's going to give me the counts like that and then i could go mutate um marital is equal to uh fact reorder marital by n right and then go ggplot a yes marital n plus um oh i don't have four cats i'm just going to do relevel then that's a base function it does the same thing. What is going on now? Um, probably ref must be. Oh, not read level. Reorder. There we go. All right. So there's those. Uh, maybe I'll switch that instead. That's better. Okay. So there's plot two. And then plot three is going to be proportion of X variables. Okay, so basically I'm just going to take the same thing for plot three. Um, but then I'm going to say uh, after my count and my mutate, um, I could say prop is equal to n divided by sum of n, right? Um, and that's uh, hang on, I didn't want to do all of that, just this part. Okay, so that gives me my proportion. And then I can do, um, instead of n, now I'm going to put prop on the x-axis. And then I'm going to do geom call, but then I'm going to do plus scale x continuous. And I'm going to say labels equals scales. Okay. And there we go. 0%, 2%, 20%, 30%, 40%. All right. And then again, this, um, if we look at categorical, we could switch this for anything. Let's go like uh, relig. And that's going to stay the same now, but that's not actually what it is. So this axis is wrong, but whatever. Okay. So those are our three plots. Okay, then we're going to do a table on the other page. Let's pause on the table for a second. Let's just do these three plots. Okay, so we have our menu item, which um, I'm going to call this plot instead. 
and the tab name is going to be plot. And um, for the, I guess we can just keep it chart bar. And then for this one, instead of bin counts, we'll call it table. Okay, and the tab name will be table and icon table. Okay, now instead of slider input, we're gonna do radio buttons, right? Um, and my input ID is going to be, I'll call it var, right? My label will be variable, okay? And then my choices will be equal to the names of categorical. Okay, so most of this stuff up here, I'm gonna get rid of before I actually run this thing, but categorical, I'm gonna keep, okay? Cause that's just my categorical ones. All right, that's gonna be my choices. I'm For my selected, I'll make it marital. Right, that first one we were looking at, okay? Now we get to our dashboard body and uh, I, I think I did this slightly wrong. I was looking at um, my code earlier. So I'm gonna just erase that. I'm gonna go fluid row, okay? And then within that, I'll go tab items. And within that, I'll go tab item. Okay, so this is my plot, okay? This is everything. So this, this corresponds to that. So I'll say tab name here, just to be very clear. Name equals plot. Okay, so everything in here is going to go in this first button. Okay, so I'm going to create a box for my first one. I'm going to title it um, Box Plots. Okay, and then I'll say plot output, and then I'll call it whatever I'm going to call it in my server. Okay, so I'll call it um bps maybe just bp um and then i can do some additional things here i'll change my height to 900 okay um and then i'm going to do an, a second box now okay this is going to be for my second plot up here so i'll call this one counts okay and i'm going to do plot output again and I'm going to call it whatever I'm going to call it in my server. So I'll just do count lowercase. Okay. And then height, I'll say 400. Okay. And then one more box. Title is going to be oops, proportions. Plot output. Um, plot output. Uh, whatever I'm going to call it in my server. Props, okay, height equals 400. And these heights I actually messed around with earlier, so I know that those are approximately right. Okay, now server, I'm gonna get rid of all of this because it's um, just not gonna be helpful for me here. So first I'm gonna say output VP. Okay, so I'm creating this box plot here, okay? So that's going to be defined as plot or render plot, okay? And then I'm gonna do curly braces so I can say here's a bunch of stuff in it. Then I'm gonna come back up here and grab my plot one, okay? And it just looks like this. And up here, I'm actually just gonna do my theme set. In minimal 20, let's go 20, okay? So I have a shiny and shiny dashboard. I'm obviously going to need some other things besides that. I'll do library dplyr, which I will need, and library ggplot2. Okay. Put this there. Well, whatever. I'll keep it there for now. Okay. So I'm going to put this in here, but my var here is uh, where it's going to be different, right? So I'm going to say. Uh, bang bang sim input var okay and again i have to do this bang bang sim because this var is going to be passed as a character and i need it to be evaluated as not a character okay all right um so that's good and then i could 
make it fancier if I wanted to, but I'll hold off on that for now. Output counts now. Okay, render plot. Okay, then I'm gonna do this second plot up here. Okay. Come down here. And then uh, this is a little bit trickier um, because of the fact reordering. So what I would do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna count bang bang sim input var. Um, but then for the mutate, I'm probably just gonna do it like this. I'm gonna say var is equal to reorder. And then I should be able to do bang bang sim input var there. And then I can just put my var here. And then now I can say plus um, scale y discrete. Actually, I'll just do it like this. This will be easier. Y lab, nothing. Okay. Um, or even labs. Okay, I think that should work. And then third plot output plot props. Okay. And the plot. This is obviously a lot. Um, grab this. My cat is talking in the background. Okay, come down here, put it in there. And so we're gonna count bang bang sim input var. Um, and then this is gonna be same as up here. We'll just copy this. Okay. And then we'll put var here. Oops, not that var. And we should be good there. And then I'll just do this again. Okay, that should be all of the main counts. And I think everything is going to work here. We can get rid of that. Um, and I think we're good to go. Let's see if it works. That was a lot of coding and we, it doesn't work. Okay, so what's going on here? Something with our radio buttons. Input ID var, label equals variable unused argument oh i just have uh i think it's input i e yeah okay so that's all it is run again all right let's open here and look at that that's pretty beautiful right now hopefully it works here we go race yay income yay pretty neat right I think it's pretty neat. Um, so this is all messed up and we could do things to fix that. If you look at the one that I have, um, that I actually spent a little more time on in the examples, it's uh, it's a little prettier on multiple fronts. Okay. Next, we need to do the table, but before we I do that, are there questions on this part of what I just did? Okay, so let's go back to R and uh, we will create our table. So I have my tab items here, right? Here's my tab item. And then I'm gonna create one more tab item. Okay, and uh, the tab name is going to be table, right? That matches what's up here, okay? And then I'm going to create a box. And I, like I said, like reactable. So I'll do reactable output. Okay. And then I need to just call it whatever I'm going to call it in the server. So I'll call it react table. Okay. And um, we can change the height on that one too if we want. All right. Now, 
down here, we need to create another output for that. So I'll go output dollar sign react table. And then we're going to go render reactable. Okay. And then in here now, we just need to figure out what the table is that we want to create. So let's do that outside of here so we can kind of mess with it. So I have D still looks like this, right? And so I'm going to say D group by, let's say, uh, marital. Okay. Then summarize. And we want to say all the things we want. So n is equal to n. Mean is equal to mean TV hours. And a dot rm is true. Right. Standard deviation, min, max. Uh, I think I have n mean. Oh yeah, max. Max. Okay, and then uh, we can go to reactable. And that's what it looks like. So these all need to be rounded. Um, so I could round them like I did before, or I could just say mutate. Oops, I need to do that before reactable though. Mutate if is dot numeric round to two decimal places. There we go. Okay, so that looks good. So that's basically what's going to go inside of here, except we need to switch the group by. So again, we go bang, bang, sim input var. Okay, so this React table, that's the thing we're creating. It comes up here in its own tab, reactable output there, right? And this tab name is defined by table, which is one of our menu items, okay? So run that. And now refresh our dashboard. This all looks the same. So that's good. Then we click on table. And now we have the table that we also get, which changes by thing. OK? So that was a lot, I know. Um, but it, and that is what I would consider like more of a complete app. Right, so it still need like what I just did, still needs a lot of like cleaning and polishing and whatever. But like the bulk of the the app is there, and now it just needs the polishing. Okay, so um, again, I want to reiterate. I know that that's a lot. Like we just went through a bunch of code, and it's a bunch of me live coding stuff, and that can be um, hard to follow along sometimes, or it can be kind of easy to follow along, but then it's harder to actually do, right? So hopefully this lecture like has gotten you into a little bit of doing at the first, especially, and then now more watching as we're building up more and more complicated apps, okay? Any questions before I move on? Okay. All right. I think I had walkthrough because I was just going to walk you through the code. I wasn't actually going to write it all, but oh well, we wrote it all. Okay, extensions. Um, so uh, there are a lot of extensions for Shiny. Um, and then there's a few for Shiny dashboard. Shiny is much bigger than Shiny Dashboard, okay? So if you want to do extension type stuff, um, Shiny is probably gonna be your better bet. But a lot of the things that work for Shiny actually also work for Shiny Dashboard because Shiny Dashboard is really just a wrapper around Shiny itself, okay? One of the neater ones I think is this Shiny Themes. So um, there's a whole bunch of different themes that you can use and uh, actually, this is not the one I was thinking of, but this is still kind of neat. 
Um, so you can see the different, all the different themes and how different they look. So you can theme your Shiny app very easily just by changing the theme. Um, so here's Shiny themes. You load Shiny themes, and then at the top you say Fluid Page theme, Shiny theme, whatever you want it to be. Okay, and that'll change a lot of it. Um, you can also add your own CSS, which is fun, um, but can take you down rabbit holes. Um, and then there's also one called dashboard themes, which uh, is basically the same sort of thing, but it's not as well supported and it's not as um, as big, but it, it does some of the same sort of stuff. Um, it has these those value boxes in sh uh, shiny dashboard are there just by default um but uh yeah so here's here you go title theme to the dashboard header okay um so there's a bunch of different stuff that you can do in here too to define your own things but like these look really nice right um and i think these value boxes really help too and then thematic is actually what I was thinking of originally, um, which is pretty cool because you can do this auto theming stuff where you're creating a, um, a you know, shiny app, but then when you change your theme, so, so shiny themes, the one I showed first, shiny theme darkly, right? It goes to this. And then thematic will allow you to automatically have your plots match that theme. So it's pretty neat, I think, um, because that's kind of complicated, but it does it for you pretty easily. OK, so that's another one that is worth checking out. And. Um, I think we're going to pause on reactivity because that's a big topic and complicated. And I feel like we're already filled to the brim. So if I try to continue to go down more complicated things, we'll just end up spilling over. <laughs>